Our first speaker, Chris, will talk to you about the shiny new part of the uh, database event. So the, uh, the event today came from uh, Chris uh, contacting me and uh, saying that he has some cool stuff to show us. Um, so we can today compare uh, two new databases to a massive Postgres deployment, but it's not entirely a comparison, these are different stories, but we can see how in today's world Postgres is deployed and how the newcomers are trying to improve on how we were doing things before. So, thank you Chris, thanks for coming. Hi. Uh, how many folks here have done anything using serverless uh, style function as a service, um, you know, deployments or development? Right on. Uh, so I see that that is growing really fast. If you look at the uh, the Google trends for serverless, it's one of the fastest growing uh, deployment architectures out there. I think it's giving con containers uh, run for their money. So if you haven't done any serverless programming today, we'll at least give you a sense of you know, when you might want to use it. Uh, we won't go too deep on that. It's really just kind of uh, the last layer of the onion that we'll add at the end. But uh, distributed ledger is also one of those topics that is, uh, right now it's at the peak of Gartner's hype cycle. So that means the next thing is the trough of dis disillusionment. So <laughs> I'm here to take advantage of that and tell you why uh, you know, there are ways to implement distributed ledger that skip the hype. Um, so, my name is Chris Anderson. My background, I'm one of the founders of Couchbase and uh, the creator of the mobile technology there. Uh, and now I'm the director of Fauna at Product, so, or director of <laughs> Product at Fauna. And uh, I just got into Amsterdam yesterday. Uh, so, right now it's about 6 a.m. my time. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions during the talk. If anything, you know, if you want clarification, we can make it interactive. Um, also, I'm on Twitter at jchris, or uh, I forgot to bring my cards. So, chris at fauna.com, um, and uh, if you want to reach out and talk to me. So, the blockchain is technology I'm just going to assume most people are familiar with, but the, uh, you know, in a nutshell, it's uh, kind of like a linked list, and that is it's a data structure where each item in the data structure contains a pointer to uh, the previous item, and you can detect tampering because the pointer is a signature of the previous item. Uh, if you do something else on top of this blockchain, uh, most likely some proof of work uh, type of contest to see who can create the next block, then you get uh, and even more interesting, you know, not just is it untamperable um, from a particular head, but adding each new item is done in a way that uh, makes the whole data structure immutable. So that's useful, but um, it's expensive and complicated. Uh, it's useful because you can use it to build a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or to agree, uh, you know, to make like a cryptographic hash of some other content non-repudiatable. So you could, uh, you know, say I had this document at such and such time, but uh, it's not really designed to scale uh, or to have a high transaction rate. So it's a little bit holding us down, and maybe we can get the job done without the blockchain. So if you wanted to have a hashtag for today, it would be no blockchain because it's not necessary for the job we're trying to do. So. When you look at a regular ledger, it looks a lot like a database table. A database table is going to have rows and columns and, uh, you know, the interesting feature of databases is that you can run transactions across these tables and update them, uh, you know, all together. So, we'll just file that away in the back of our mind. Before we were trying to get distributed with this ledger stuff, it was just a database problem. Now, a distributed ledger is when you essentially have consensus across uh, you know, multiple sites about the contents of the, data, the database. So if we're going to run the database worldwide and have a, a, you know, a copy where everyone agrees, essentially 
that's a distributed ledger. We can all look and find the account balance and we know we're all going to agree on the result. So, you know, there's going to be some, uh, obviously you have to build it right, but building it as a database, you know, as an application running on top of a database instead of running on top of an esoteric blockchain protocol seems like it might be worth thinking about given that we're hitting dead ends with blockchain scalability. So, as a you know, director of product for Fauna, when I see that problem and I see the Fauna DB technology that is designed to run transactions uh, you know, globally, uh, I think, well that sounds like a good fit. I should build a, I should build a toy demo at least just to explore, uh, you know, explore what's happening. So I built a pet store demo because that's where you start. You have to have a pet store. And you have players and they can put, they can drag items up for sale and then other players can buy the items and if you don't have enough money in your balance, if you don't have enough credits, then the transaction will fail. And so it's a very simple game, I'm about to show you a demo of it, but the, the point of it is that it's running on a cluster with global availability uh, and you know, independent sites with full copies of the data set on multiple continents. So. Uh, we'll talk after I show the demo about how you would get serious about turning uh, a toy like this into a real distributed ledger application. So here, uh, here's the screen, here's the players, these are the items that are for sale, and uh, it looks like, yeah, there we go. So Bob is, is putting the baby chick for sale, and now, uh, Someone's going to buy this leopard. Looks like it's going to Carol, and her balance is going down. And now Alice is going to try to buy the python, but she can't afford it. And so we had insufficient funds. And just a simple transaction app so that you can see uh, you know, objects that are associated with everything that's in the database schema for the application that we're talking about. So each user has a balance in their account. There are records of each purchase that's made, and then each item that's for sale has a price. So anytime you're going to transfer an item from one player to the other, the player who's buying it has to have enough credits to buy it or else the transaction will fail. So we'll look at all that code later on. Uh, first here's just a preview of what the data looks like in QuantaDB. This is a screenshot of the uh, web dashboard associated with that application. So these are the purchases from that previous screen and you know here you can see the price and these are links to the objects that correspond to the item and the buyer and the seller. Uh, this admin UI, also you can see here that there are nested databases and so those nested databases can be used uh, for hierarchical multi-tenancy which is a security feature I won't get to talk too much about, but you know, in a real implementation, you would probably end up using that feature um, as part of the security uh, defense in depth. So if we're going to get serious about building a ledger like this, first we need to understand how global consensus can be managed without a blockchain. Then uh, we want to look at what the ledger transaction itself is going to look like. And what kind of code are we going to have to write in order to program this distributed ledger? And finally, uh, you'll want to know, you know what kind of security model makes it so I can put banking into this particular database. Um, you know, what are the layers uh, that would, you know, make make it so that only you know the right uh, you know right parts of the application have the authority to do particular uh, actions. So I talked about how global consensus is really just having copies of the ledger in multiple locations that you know are going to be in agreement. And the idea is that we'll just run the database at each site. And so when you've got, uh, you know, it, it should be as simple as that with 
a few details that we'll get into, but first let's just look at the architecture. So we're looking now at one site, and, and really each site's probably gonna run a high availability cluster, so that can manage its own uh, uptime, and if you have machines failing, you can replace them without any downtime. Um, and then if we, uh, you know, as we zoom in, we can see this cluster is, is made out of multiple machines, and the, uh, because it's high availability, so there's going to be more than one copy of the entire data set in the cluster, and you can also partition it for horizontal scaling. Uh, the team that started work on FaunaDB about four years ago was the team that scaled Twitter. So uh, folks who installed the fail whale when Twitter was young and then conquered it over the years uh, moved on and decided they wanted to build a general purpose database. So in terms of scalability and performance, uh, the, the point was to build something that could run at uh, you know, global scale and uh, you know, answer the full range of database use cases instead of just picking very narrow use cases. So in this architecture, each node runs FaunaDB Enterprise, which just gets packaged as a jar. It's written in Scala. And the cluster is you know, designed to be uh, dynamically resizable. So how do we manage consistency across this mesh of machines that we're dynamically rescaling? There's a protocol called Calvin, which Fauna implements a variation of. And essentially, you know, uh, databases have, uh, most databases have what's called a write-ahead log. And so the write-ahead log is typically where transactions go before they've been applied to indexes and to um, you know, the main records in storage. And the reason they're written like that is because if the database crashes sometime after the transaction has been committed to the write-ahead log, but before all the write effects have been played out to the rest of the database architecture, then on restart it can pick up and clean itself up and anyone who thought what they had done had been saved, is they're gonna get what they expected. So instead of having our write ahead log just be a file on disk, the FaunaDB write ahead log is, uh, it uses this distributed Calvin protocol, which uh, I don't know, I guess, I don't expect many hands to go up, but are, are folks in the room familiar with Raft uh, or Paxos? Okay, so um, uh, we use Raft, we use a variant on Raft um, with respect to the master re-election process, but we use Raft to agree on which log segments come next as we're building our write ahead log. And uh, every time a tr you know, transaction commits, it commits on all the replica sites. The, uh, and each one of those log segments can contain as many transactions as came in during the time period. So if you had a, a whole bunch of transactions land in a, in a 20 millisecond window, then those are all gonna be in the same log segment uh, as they're broadcast into the Calvin pipeline. Then all, uh, what gets to be interesting also in database architecture is when you have uh, multiple writes come in uh, transactions at the same time that interleave and touch the same records. Uh, databases will have to reorder those in a way that preserves their semantics but makes it so they don't conflict. And so how that shows up in Fauna is if two transactions come in that touch the same record, then one of them will retry. So some of that log reordering will happen, but at the end of the day you get uh, serializable uh, semantics and it allows you to you know, build ledger applications or anything else that needs strong consistency. So if you're interested more in how this protocol works, uh, Daniel Abadi is a Yale uh, professor of computer science and he came up with the Calvin protocol and wrote an article on our blog uh, comparing Calvin to Spanner because Spanner is kind of the alternate architecture, it's the other option if you want to build a distributed uh, table, a distributed database system, the Spanner architecture, uh, when you look at the map, to me it almost feels inside out um, because the clocks are all tracked around the write effects 
instead of around the transactions going through the write ahead log. So uh, they have different pros and cons, but we think Calvin is better. Um, <laughs> and uh, we recently raised our Series A, uh, and Google Ventures was one of the big participants in the round, so Google's also betting on us. Um, so the uh, getting into the code you would write, you're supposed to, your eyes are supposed to glaze over. This is a lot of code. Um, the point I'm trying to get across here is that complex functions can be written as a single transaction and then submitted to the database. And the database will execute the whole transaction and then return the result. And it all happens atomically. So uh, this is a, a long, maybe one of the more complex queries that I've written. Um, and before we move on, and I'll show you like one line at a time of some stuff so you can see it in an easy to understand way. But first I'll just like bold the lines that matter and then I'll tell you what they do. So uh, here we're just making sure the item is for sale. And here if the buyer is the seller then it's not actually, you know, we're not buying an item. We are going to make it not for sale anymore. Uh, now this is the part where it starts to feel like banking. If the buyer balance is less than the item price, then they don't have enough funds available. Um, so, and I'll talk more about how the query language works in a second. Um, so, otherwise, and now here everything's good, we're just going to uh, apply the transaction. So, we're writing a purchase record, that's creating a new object with class purchases. Uh, then we're updating the existing buyer with uh, their new balance, which is the existing balance minus the item price. And uh, again, we're adding to the seller balance uh, by updating the object in the database that corresponds to the seller's account. Uh, and then at the end, we're updating uh, the item to have a new owner. So all that commits atomically and uh, you know, usually a transaction or a query will look more like this. So in this case, all we're doing is uh, updating the balance on the buyer's account. And you know, this could just be a literal number here that would setting the balance to 500 um, if we wanted. But it's a functional query language. So uh, we actually call it FTL, functional transaction language. And it uses query builders. So if you've ever used an XML builder or something like that, uh, what's happening is all this at runtime is essentially composing the query. And you can put, you know, you can inject literal values from your runtime into it. Uh, there's some nuances around, you know, writing runtime loops. Instead, you probably want to write your loops in the query language. Uh, and the languages uh, available in your environment. So uh, this is what it looks like in Ruby. And we've got query builders in all these languages. They all output the same thing at the end. So uh, you can have different runtime environments talking to the same database easily. So wrapping up this, uh, uh, this section, I think it's important to understand that asset transactions are valuable not just when you absolutely need them, but they're also good because you know you don't want to have to deal with quorums or uh, you know eventual consistency um, artifacts, especially in applications where the security matters because you don't want like a stale security policy being applied or something. Um, but also applications just get simpler. Even if you're writing an online game, it might be easier not to have to worry about um, you know, waiting for the database to reconcile. So what this means is that we can start going into the use cases. Like when uh, NoSQL happened, it was, it was interesting to watch because everyone wanted to use, you know, they've been trying to get rid of their Oracle forever. Um, and they wanted to uh, use, you know, Couchbase, Mongo, Cassandra for those Oracle 
workloads and it didn't work because they didn't have the transactional support. Um, but they all have done the database evaluations and they know how to decide how to adopt new technology. So uh, now that we're able to address those transactional workloads, uh, the market is moving a lot faster than it was the first time around. So this is the last section where I'll talk about the security model and uh, we'll uh, get your introduction to um, Amazon Lambda and serverless stuff. So that graphic is a representation of the hierarchical multi-tenancy that, that I might not really get time to talk about. Um, but uh, the architecture here, so that game that I showed you, it's not really secure. Like the, it's got the right data model for security, but anyone who's in the browser can run whatever query they want against the database. Um, so here's what we would do to take it and make it secure. Um, the first thing we do is have uh, you know some kind of application layer. In this case, we'll use Lambda. It could be uh, you know a Ruby on Rails app server um, that responds to the user events. So some kind of web server that will be running the Fauna client and issuing queries to Fauna. The Fauna queries have a very narrow surface area. So the um, application runtime can only issue predefined queries. It, it can only, you know, say like, uh, sell item to player would be like the name of the function to invoke. And that, uh, and so that Fauna, um, or rather that Lambda can't do anything else. It wouldn't have the access to go and, you know, run queries that, the, um, you know, that hadn't been built into the application specifically. Then those predefined functions which, uh, you know, it's just a, a fun feature. They're running using uh, access level that doesn't allow them to do um, any funny business. So I'll talk more about, you know, changing the schema or editing the history of objects, but you won't want those predefined functions that are really just there to do your core transactional workload to be able to alter the history, for instance. Um, you would want to reserve that for an administrator. So we'll go through those steps in more detail. Um, so AWS Lambda is one of the function as a service providers. All the major cloud providers have some way to run JavaScript function in response to user events. And there's also some startups that are coming out that have more specialized function as a service runtimes. Uh, the thing I like to do with them is the stuff that used to happen in your Ruby on Rails stack. So uh, basically, um, you know, authentication, um, triggering things in response to user events. But when I go to like serverless conference and I look at what else people are doing with them, they're using it uh, for lightweight MapReduce a lot. So you might have a function that runs every time something is uploaded to an S3 bucket. And you know, all it does is create a thumbnail from the PDF file or something. So. Uh, this is a, it's a, my, it appeals to me because I'm not very good at keeping servers running. And so instead of having a server um, abstraction layer, I have a code abstraction layer and it's up to Amazon to keep it running. Um, so in the distributed ledger, this is going to be the code that submits the queries that call those predefined functions. And I like this architecture too because it's trivial to run those functions on premise or to move them to a different cloud provider because it's basically just JavaScript. And unless you're enmeshed in the rest of your cloud provider services, then the um, you know changing the function signature isn't going to be that hard to do. So the predefined functions that I've been talking about are an API uh, Fauna DB calls as a user defined function. So as a developer, you can submit a query fragment and it gets stored uh, so that other, other queries can call it. And uh, what this paragraph means is, is essentially that you can have, uh, have it set up where 
you know, only certain users can call the function, um, and uh, the functions can only do certain operations on the underlying database, according to the security model. So uh, it allows you to build, you know, kind of any place you need to bridge between, you know, that wild land of, of user data and events and, um, you know, the secure land of, of well-defined interfaces. Uh, the user-defined functions is a good way to do that. So the last concept um, around how you know, we've got the security primitives to allow you to run something like uh, ledger applications is this temporal data. So I already mentioned that uh, for distributed ledger, the user-defined functions would not be able to mess with the history. Um, but for these kinds of applications, it's often an important requirement. One, it's hard for blockchain to satisfy that you know, like a, um, somebody fat fingers a wire transfer and instead of twenty thousand dollars, it's two hundred. Um, and those are those can be managed by changing you know the transaction that went in um, and rolling its value back then. And that can simplify a lot of stuff because then the timestamp is the same and all the tax implications or whatever right that would have fallen out of the original transaction can be calculated. Um, instead of uh, you know, having to run a whole bunch of compensating transactions to figure it out. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, there's some uh, resources on the website. So that's basically what I've got to say about using FaunaDB for the distributed ledger use case. Uh, I could talk more about the database itself, but I'd rather take questions if folks haven't. In the back. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the advantage of FaunaDB over uh, over uh, blockchain is performance, right? So could you could you do some numbers uh, and what is the biggest installation and for what, what what is the performance experience? So the FaunaDB the question is uh, FaunaDB performance compared to blockchain performance, and uh, I don't know right now what uh, Bitcoin. Uh, blockchain commit time is, but I was just reading an article that takes like the same amount of energy to commit a new block to the blockchain as it takes to run your house for a week. And so th there's just, uh, you know, it's not really designed to be scalable in that sense. Uh, whereas FaunaDB has the same, roughly, uh, the same performance and scalability characteristics as something like Cassandra. So hundreds of you know writes a second and an unlimited amount of reads. You mentioned it yourself, so can you compare Fauna with the Cassandra? Uh, well the biggest difference is the ability to run complex transactions um, and have global consistency. Okay. Uh, the, I think that there's also some additional benefits that you get by being able to send relatively complex queries because then your wire protocol isn't as chatty. You mentioned uh, that when uh, committing a transaction, um, if it fails, needs to retry. And thinking about that raft implementation you speak about, and, I, and then I'm thinking globally, I'm thinking there's a lot of latency there. So when if I commit, how long does it take for me to get the answer back from a node that yes, it is committed? How long does that take? So your uh, commit time is going to be a function of the speed of light between your data centers. Yeah. And uh, I think it's like two round trips for best case. When you start running into conflicts, the round trips can go up. We had someone asking for web support where they had built you know, whatever the worst case was, like thousands of conflicts on a single key. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, eventually you just start getting timeouts. It starts taking more than 30 seconds and mm -hmm. um, it only it only applies to the earlier of the transactions. So, if, well, oh, go ahead. So if I can follow up on that question, so the throughput, you can, you can establish a high throughput if you have a lot of simultaneous transactions waiting for commit state. So you, you can do a lot of stuff simultaneously, but each single transaction takes a considerable amount of time to commit. It takes, well, it depends. So it, it depends on what you're going for, and that would uh, essentially, 
because the transaction time is related to the um, raft agreement, and that's related to the round trip time between the data centers, if you have applications that need a low latency writes, mm -hmm. then you can sacrifice some geographic distribution to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And we have a feature that's shipping, uh, hopefully the first half of next year, called dynamic site selection, that allows you to run a cluster with 50 data centers and put a logical database on two of them, or three of them, so that your logical databases don't suffer the performance of having to commit to the entire physical cluster. Uh, question? Yeah, and you spoke a bit about the architecture. Uh, the architecture of QuantumDB? Uh, maybe most like the, um, the, commit, the commit log protocol, uh, the, the write pipeline. So the queries are sent to the server over HTTP and JSON, and those are um, those can hit any node, it doesn't matter which one. And then that node will um, run the query locally to figure out what the write effects are gonna be. And then it uses that to see if there's any outstanding conflicts in the live log segments. Um, and, the, uh, and if there aren't any, then it just adds it to the next log segment. I mean, if there are some, then it does the thing that the engineering guys will tell you about, <laughs> where we you know, get our reordering right. Um, and uh, so then once, the, that, once that gets into a committed log segment, then everything else is uh, just going to play out on all the cluster members, um, you know, the same on every host. So we just broadcast the log to and so you can have read-only or read-write cluster members, and they apply the write effects to their indexes and storage files. Um, the storage engine we use looks kind of like the storage engine from, um, from LDAP, uh, which also looks a little bit like um, the way that uh, Lucene does the generational storage stuff. But uh, I don't know it well enough to tell you too much about it. You said earlier that you're using RAF for master operation, and now you kind of said that any master can do the writes. Oh, uh, no, there's two different things going on. So the question is about how we use RAF. Um, so we use RAF not for master election. We use RAF to decide um, what order the segments of the log are applied. And so, Raft just is used to, there, there are no masters, um, or rather it's, it's a multi-master, but the log segments are ordered using Raft so that that commit happens on all the masters or none of them. Um, so the log is essentially, um, you know, the log has, is a, a Raft key, or the current log position is a Raft key that's replicated across all the cluster members. And then for throughput, we can actually partition the log, but that's a different thing. Um, and then that yeah, master election is just, we do some um, optimizations to what happens when, when a node drops out and comes back in. But that's, that's a different thing, too. So, yeah, um, you can write to any node, and the place that the write has to be applied is not a particular node, but like this logical log. Um, that's defined by the RAF protocol. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, answering the previous question what uh, you're planning to add the feature to address the scalability issue by uh, having um, an ability to write just two, let's say, out of the 50, 15 databases. But that doesn't that mean what you're inducing, like a completely arbitrary consistency? Well, oh, that's a good question. So. The dynamic site selection applies to a logical database, and um, adding new sites to that database is a different operation than adding new physical sites to the cluster. So the consistency model would apply for those sites the database is on. Um, we're not talking about like dynamically adding a new site um, for, for that. So it's not that you would have overlapping data sets where you would sometimes have commits here and sometimes have commits here. It's that this database lives here. And so you have to, you get correct consistency on that database. Thank you.
You will the data centers look the same? So if you do the sharding for horizontal scaling, then does that happen in each data center the same way, or is that per data center and you have this that's a that's a good question. Um, right now, the software is relatively young, so the answer is the same everywhere. Um, the other thing that I haven't mentioned yet, but it's kind of radical for um, the kind of technology that Fauna DB is, that we don't have uh, right now. We don't have any tunables, so the you know there's not like things that you have to tweak in the config file to make it fast in your environment, um, and we're going to try to stay that way. So if we did come up with some kind of, if we decided that some partitioning schemes were better in some environments than others, it might be automatic. Okay. Ready, ready. Thank you.